The Snowtown Murders was a series of killings committed in South Australia uh, in a period between mid-August 1992 and May 1999. In that period, 12 people were murdered in various different locations across uh, South Australia. Ironically, the majority of the victims were murdered in Murray Bridge, east of Adelaide, where only one victim was murdered in Snowtown. But of course, the eight of the victims were found in barrels in Snowtown. Now, the principal offenders in these murders were John Bunting, Robert Wagner, Jamie Lasakis, and Mark Hayden. John Bunting was undoubtedly the ringleader and instigator. I think without Bunting, there wouldn't have been any murders. Robert Wagner was his second in command and henchman. Jamie Lasakis was just a teenager when these murders were committed. He was the son of Bunting's partner, Elizabeth Harvey, and fell under Bunting's sway. And the fourth man was Mark Hayden, who was little more than a clean-up man, uh, accomplice, who did whatever Bunting told him to do. They were the Snowtown murders. John Bunting was born on September the 4th, 1966, in a suburb called Inala in Brisbane, Queensland. Uh, Bunting was an only child. When he was eight years old, Bunting was gang raped by a friend's brother, older brother, and his friends. Not only was he sexually abused in this incident, but was also burnt with cigarettes. Though Bunting kept this to himself. At the age of 13, Bunting meets an older man named only as Benny and they begin assaulting uh, any suspected pedophiles. At the age of 17, Bunting has a daughter after a casual relationship. However, both the mother and daughter soon uh, return home to England. In February 1986, Bunting, age 19, along with several friends and two cars, leaves Brisbane and begins driving towards Perth. Uh, but he only gets as far as Adelaide, where he settles in and begins living permanently and eventually finds work at an abattoir. At a training course, when he's age 21, uh, Bunting meets an 18-year-old woman named Veronica Tripp, who has an intellectual disability, and the two begin a relationship. In September 1989, both Bunting and Veronica marry. And in December 1991, they move into a house at 203 Waterloo Corner Road in Salisbury North. Robert Wagner was born on November the 28th, 1971 in Parramatta, Sydney, New South Wales. Uh, Wagner's father left the family when he was only nine months old. At the age of three, Wagner, along with his mother and sister, moved to Adelaide in South Australia and into the northern suburb of Elizabeth West. Uh, Bunting is, dis uh, correction, sorry, Wagner is dys dyslexic and never learns to read or write. At the age of seven, Wagner is sexually abused by the teenage son of his mother's friend and in the wake of this uh, terrible happening, attempts suicide. Circa 1985, the then 13-year-old Wagner meets uh, the older, much older man named Barry Lane, who at that time is around 29, 30 years old. Uh, Lane grooms Wagner and, begin, and the two begin a relationship. At that point, uh, Barry Lane was um, in, a, in his female persona where he was known as Vanessa in and uh, dressed and acted as, as a female when he met Wagner. Now, Barry Lane, back in 1980, had actually been imprisoned for four months for sexually assaulting two 12-year-old boys. Fast forward to 1990, and the then 18-year-old Wagner and Barry Lane move into a house at number one, Bingham Road in Salisbury North, just around the corner 
from Waterloo Corner Road. Jamie Vosakis is born on December the 24th, 1979. I actually can't find exactly where he was born, but I'm thinking, I'm assuming it was in South Australia. His parents are Elizabeth Harvey and Spiros Vlasakis. As a young boy, Jamie is uh, sexually abused by his own father, Spiros. On June 13th, 1986, Spiros Vlasakis drops dead suddenly of a heart attack at the age of just 49. Soon after, his mother, Elizabeth Harvey, begins a relationship with a man named Marcus Johnson, who has a son from a previous marriage named David Johnson. Uh, soon after, Elizabeth begins to descend into mental illness. And Jamie is actually repeatedly raped by his own half-brother, Troy Ude. They share the same mother in Elizabeth Harvey, though have different fathers. Uh, Troy himself had been sexually abused by his uh, stepfather, Spiros Vlasakis. And circa 1991, Elizabeth Harvey, Marcus Johnson, Jamie Vlasakis and some other children move into Kilsby Street in Elizabeth Park. Mark Hayden is born on December the 4th, 1958. Now trying to find information on Mark Hayden's early years is, is very difficult. I was unable to find exactly where he was born, but again, I'm assuming it was here in South Australia. Um, Hayden meets John Bunting at a welding course uh, here in Adelaide in 1989 and the two become friends. So that's how Mark Hayden enters the world of John Bunting. I'm standing in front of 203 Waterloo Corner Road, Salisbury North. In December 1991, John Bunting and his wife Veronica moved into this home. Now for starters, this is not the exact home it was back in those days. After the murders were discovered in 1999, this house was demolished. The, ho the old housing trust houses and replaced with these newer ones. So this is not the way the house looked in, 1990s, in the 1990s, but it's certainly the same location. So when Bunting and his wife Veronica moved here in 1991, at number 205 Waterloo Corner Road, just to the left there, was a neighbor named Robert Skews and it was through Robert Skews that Bunting would meet Robert Wagner and uh, Barry Lane, who lived nearby. Now the first of the Snowtown murder victims, 19-year-old Clinton Trezise, was actually murdered in this, in this home, or the former home, in uh, circa July, August 1992. He was sitting in the lounge when Bunting came up behind him with a shovel and bludgeoned him to death. After that, Bunting, assisted by Mark Hayden and Barry Lane. They buried Clinton's body in a shallow grave at Lower Light in a paddock, which is about 30 kilometers from here. Clinton's re skeletal remains were discovered on August the 16th, 1994. But it wouldn't be until 1999 that the remains were identified as Clinton Trezise and linked with uh, Bunting and Wagner and the other Snowtown murders. The second murder victim is 26-year-old Ray Davies. Davies is murdered on December 25th, 1995, Christmas Day. Before he is uh, murdered, Bunting and Wagner drive Davies 175 kilometers to a town called Bacara where Bunting I think briefly has a house. There he is beaten before being driven all the way back here to 203 Waterloo Corner Road Salisbury North and being murdered. As he's being murdered in the in the bathtub they even managed to get Elizabeth Harvey to join in 
on torturing Ray Davies. Eventually, after he died, he's buried in the backyard here. Now, of course, Suzanne Allen is also buried here sometime in November 1996. Now, on May 20th, 1999, the eight bodies in the six barrels at Snowtown are discovered by police. And the following day, May 21st, Bunting, Wagner and Hayden are arrested, which leads police back here to 203 Waterloo Corner Road. Now, on May the 23rd, 1999, the body of Suzanne Allen is recovered. Three days later, on May 26, 1999, the body of Suzanne Davies, a uh, Suzanne Ray Davies, excuse me, is recovered right here in the backyard of 203 Waterloo Corner Road. Here on Bingham Road, Salisbury North. And it was here at number one Bingham Road just 200 metres from 203 Waterloo Corner Road at the time Bunting moved in lived here Robert Wagner and Barry Lane now they kept a pretty raucous household with a variety of dogs German Shepherds and Dobermans one of Wagner's dogs he called Adolf uh, in honour of uh, Hitler which um, sums up Wagner's political ideology. The neighbours constantly complain about the smell. Uh, there's dog and cat excrement inside and outside. Uh, Wagner and Lane have various violent arguments and eventually in 1995 go their separate ways. But that's where they lived just 200 meters from 203 Waterloo Corner Road. I'm in Killsby Street in Elizabeth Park, the northern suburbs of Adelaide. Now in this anonymous street is where the lives of John Bunting and Jamie Vlasakis intertwined. Now, before we get to the, the former locations, I just want to point out that these, this street has changed a lot over the years. It used to be the old housing trust houses, but uh, most of them, if not all of them, have been bulldozed and replaced by much newer housing. Um, just having a look. So, just bear that in mind that these aren't the actual houses that were here in the relevant time period of the early 90s. So in 1991, Elizabeth Harvey and her partner Marcus Johnson move here into Killsby Street, along with Jamie Vlasakis and future victims Troy Ude and David Johnson. Now they must have moved in one of these houses, the old houses here. If I move over to the side of the, the opposite side of the road, the western side, um, this is number 20 Killsby Street, and here lived a pedophile named Geoffrey Payne. Now Payne used to sit on his porch and watch Jamie Vlasakis and his brothers play and began to groom Jamie. Uh, Payne invites them in and he cozies up to Marcus Johnson and eventually Jamie is allowed to have sleepovers at Payne's house where Payne begins sexually abusing him. Jamie doesn't tell anyone about this abuse with Payne threatening to kill his mother and to molest his brothers also. Now Barry Lane who, who is, is aware of these abuse going on as he knows Payne and so Barry Lane one day turns up and knocks on the door of Elizabeth Harvey and tells her 
that her boys are being sexually abused by Jeffrey Payne. So Barry Lane and Robert Wagner appear to Elizabeth Harvey, inform her that Jamie is being abused by Jeffrey Payne. They go to police. Payne is arrested, but in March 1994 he's bailed out and returns to this home here in Killsby Street, where he continues to sit on his porch and watch Jamie. Um, but Barry Lane has informed Elizabeth Harvey that he knows someone who can take care of pedophiles like Jeffrey Payne. And that man is John Bunting. And that's where John Bunting comes into the picture. He, he rides into the neighborhood as a savior, where he begins terrorizing Jeffrey Payne right here at this house. And of course, uh, for Jamie Vlasakis in particular, Barry Lane, uh, correction, John Bunting becomes a hero. And that happened right here in Killsby Street. So after John Bunting comes in and terrorizes Jeffrey Payne and becomes a hero to Jamie Vosakis, eventually Elizabeth Harvey uh, begins a relationship with Bunting and Marcus Johnson is pushed out of the picture. But all of that began here on Killsby Street. Now just a post note on Jeffrey Payne. This has got nothing to do with the Snowtown murders. But incredibly, Jeffrey Payne, the convicted pedophile, would get his comeuppance. On April 21st, 2007, Payne is actually murdered here in Adelaide. I believe in the Northfield area of Adelaide, which is in the north, northern suburbs, a bit further uh, south from here. A 55-year-old Payne was murdered by one of his victims, an 18-year-old named Timothy Schaefer, who beat Payne to death. So... How's that? John Bunting didn't get Jeffrey Payne, but one of his future victims did. Here in Killsbury Street, Elizabeth Park. I'm in Ghent Street, Salisbury North. Now I'm looking for number three Ghent Street, but unfortunately there is no number three. Um, the houses on one side are all even numbered and the street opposite has no houses, so... These are newer houses though, so I'm positive it's changed since 1995. These are much more modern houses. But nonetheless, here on this street, at number three, Ghent Street, lived Suzanne Allen, who would become murder victim number three. Now this house is only about 550 meters from 203 Waterloo Corner Road. In the backyard of number three, at Suzanne Allen's house lived Ray Davies in a caravan. Now after Davies' murder, uh, Suzanne Allen becomes uh, besotted with John Bunting, which is not good for her because she quickly becomes another target. And on sometime in November 1996, 47-year-old Suzanne Allen is murdered, victim number three. She's murdered at a house, as I said, here on Ghent Street at number three, by Bunting and Wagner. They dismember her and put her into 11 plastic bags and transport those bags to 203 Waterloo Corner Road as I said only about 600 meters from here or so after burying Suzanne Allen's remains in the backyard at 203 Bunting uses both Elizabeth Harvey and Mark Hayden's sister Gail Sinclair to pose as the dead Allen so they can collect her welfare payments which they do now they all now Bunting and Wagner always claim that Suzanne Allen died of a heart attack that they found her dead in a bedroom and then you know for whatever reason dismembered her as you do um, but of all the 12 murders Suzanne Allen was the only one there was no conviction secured against because uh, I guess the jury could not prove uh, the evidence could not be proven that they did in fact murder her so Bunting was convicted of 11 murders 
only Suzanne Allen was the murder he wasn't convicted of. But that happened here in Gent Street, Salisbury North. Just before we get into the Murray Bridge locations of the Snowtown murders, I just have to uh, make an apology. I travelled to Murray Bridge, eventually managed to get there. It wasn't easy, but I managed to get there to do the filming locations. Um, but when I reached 3 Burdekin Avenue, the conditions were not conducive to film. There were people uh, sitting outside the house. Um, there was people in the vicinity. It was just not feasible to do it. Um, it was too much of an invasion of privacy with people hanging around. So I didn't film the locations at Murray Bridge. So as a substitute for that, I'm going to use Google Maps uh, for the Murray Bridge locations for the five murders there. Again, I apologize. Um, I prefer the authentic location, but it would it would have been too difficult. It was quite it would have taken quite a while. There was a fair bit to cover at the Murray Bridge houses, particularly at three Burdick and Avenue. Um, and I just couldn't do it. If it was a nearby location and I could get there easy, I could go back another time, but I just don't have that capacity unfortunately. So Hopefully the, the Google Maps substitute um, will be sufficient. Um, uh, thank you for understanding. This is number three, Burdekin Avenue in Murray Bridge, South Australia. Uh, Murray Bridge is about 75 kilometers east of Adelaide. Now, John Bunting and Elizabeth Harvey moved into this home um, circa May 1997 and in this house four people were murdered. The first victim to be murdered in here and the fourth victim overall was 19 year old Michael Gardner also known as Michelle. At the time Michael was living with a woman named Nicole Zarita in Elizabeth Grove which was right near Robert Wagner's house at 36 Mofflin Road in Elizabeth Grove. Now, Nicole Zarita is a cousin of Veronica Mills, AKA Maxine Cole, um, who is Robert Wagner's partner. So that's the connection between Michael Gardner and his murderers. Now, Michael disappears in September, 1997. At the time, his flatmate Nicole Zarita is away working I think for a couple of weeks when she returns to her home on Eliz in Elizabeth Grove on September 16th 1997 she discovers the house has been ransacked and Michael is missing never to be seen alive again in April 1998 uh, John Bunting and Robert Wagner confessed to Jamie Blasakis that they murdered Gardner back in September 1997 now they either forced him or they lured him from his Elizabeth Grove house and drove him all the way here to 3 Burdekin Avenue, Murray Bridge, which as I said is about 75 kilometers or so from Adelaide from, from Elizabeth Grove, it's probably a bit further actually. Um, so it's a fair distance to drive, but that's what they did. They drove Michael Gardner to this house. And once they had Michael at the house, they took him into the shed now if I just move this around a bit, um, zoom in a bit, now the shed is in the back here. Obviously this was back in 1997 and this Google map is from August 2021 so but that's the shed out the back. Um, and that is where Michael is tortured and murdered. Michael's tortured with a lighter, they burn his skin and testicles and they administer electric shocks to him via something called a variac machine I believe it is. Uh, Robert Wagner begins strangling him from behind and as he's doing this, as he's being murdered, John Bunting is mocking Michael Gardner in a uh, stereotypical gay voice and eventually Wagner strangles uh, Michael to death. Michael is then placed into a barrel and a, few, and a, a soon to be victim Barry Lane is later added 
to that barrel here at Burdekin Avenue. Victim number five was 42-year-old Barry Lane, who was murdered in October 1997. Now, of course, if you remember that Barry Lane had begun a relationship with then 13-year-old Robert Wagner back in 1985. Now, they met John Bunting when Bunting moved into his home in Salisbury North on Waterloo Corner Road in late 1991. And, of course, Lane became part of Bunting's circle of well, friends, associates, despite uh, Bunting's hatred of pedophiles, homosexuals, etc. He used Barry Lane to gather information about um, uh, pedophiles in the area, and um, which the information that became very handy to him. So that's why he kept Lane around. And of course, Barry Lane also helped cover up the murder of Clinton Trezise, who was murdered by Bunting back in circa August 1992. Now, the Wagner Lane relationship, which was a tumultuous one, ended sometime in early 1996. In the beginning of 1997, uh, Barry Lane is briefly engaged to a woman named Michelle Behet, but that relationship doesn't last long. But it's also clear that Barry Lane is still deeply troubled by the murder of Clinton Trezies and talks to several people about being involved in, in a murder, which obviously makes him a marked man as far as John Bunting is concerned. Uh, in 1997, around April 1997, Barry Lane meets an 18-year-old named Thomas Trevelyan and they form a relationship and they move into a house together in Hectorville, which is in the northeastern suburbs of Adelaide. But on October the 17th, 1997, uh, John Bunting and Robert Wagner, along with Thomas Trevelyan, murder Lane in his home in Hectorville. Uh, Barry Lane's toes were crushed with pliers and they force him to ring his own mother to verbally abuse her, um, to have him tell her that he wants nothing more to do with her and that he's moving to Queensland. Of course, this is uh, part of their ruse to explain Lane's subsequent disappearance. They also extract from Barry Lane his PIN number and later they access his welfare payments. Eventually, Robert Wagner strangles Barry Lane to death. They roll him in a carpet where he's left for four days in the house before they collect him. And eventually Barry Lane enters into a barrel. Victim number six was 18 year old Thomas Trevelyan. Now Thomas had a troubled existence. He suffered from schizophrenia and he'd attempted suicide three times by the age of 14. He often dressed in army fatigues and suffered various delusions and hallucinations. Circa April 1997, he meets Barry Lane. They begin a relationship and they move into a house in Hectorville in the Adelaide suburbs, northeastern suburbs. Of course, in October 1997, Barry Lane is murdered by John Bunting and Robert Wagner with Thomas Trevelyan being coerced to participate. After that murder, Trevelyan moves into the home of Robert Wagner at 36 Mofflin Road in Elizabeth Grove. But he's only there a few weeks, for on November the 4th, 1997, an incident occurs where Thomas threatens to kill the puppy of Maxine Cole's child, Maxine Cole being Robert Wagner's partner. Um, Trevelyan chases after the child who's holding the dog with a knife before fortunately he's prevented from doing any damage. But when Wagner and Bunting return home that day and are informed about what's happened, they decide Thomas Trevelyan must die. I'm probably sure, pretty sure they probably decided that already as of course he'd been involved with the murder of Barry Lane so I'm sure he would have been on the hit list anyway. So they take Thomas for a drive into the Adelaide Hills, into the Kersbrook and Humbug Scrub area, which is northeast of the city. The exact location I simply do not know. And here they stage a suicide. They create a noose, I assume from a tree. They force Thomas to stand on a crate, put his head into the noose, and he's hanged to death. And leave and they leave him there in the bush. 
Thomas's body is found the next day by on November the 5th 1997 by a passing motorist but because of his extensive mental illness history the police believe it's simply a suicide and it's not until 1999 and the discovery of the Snowtown murders that the death of Thomas Thomas Trevelyan is revealed to be a murder by Bunting and Wagner the second victim murdered here at 3 Burdekin Avenue, Murray Bridge, and the seventh victim murdered overall is 31-year-old Gavin Porter. Now, Gavin was a heroin addict, and in 1994, he meets Jamie Blasakis, where both are on a methadone program, and the two become housemates. So that is the connection with Gavin Porter and Jamie Blasakis. In early 1998, Gavin moves into this home here at 3 Burdekin Avenue with John Bunting and the rest of the family. Now John Bunting dislikes Gavin Porter uh, intensely and this escalates when one day Bunting sits down on a couch and is pricked by one of Gavin's needles. Now in early, night, in early April 1998, one night, Gavin Porter is actually sleeping in his car in the driveway here at 3 Burdekin Avenue. Now as you can see, the driveway extends quite a distance, almost into Francis Street. So we'll assume Gavin's car is parked here in this location. Now as Gavin is sleeping in his car, John Bunting and Robert Wagner attack. Wagner begins strangling him with a rope and in the struggle Gavin Porter actually stabs John Bunting in the hand with a screwdriver. But it's to no avail and Gavin Porter is strangled to death. Now at the time of the murder of Gavin Porter Jamie Vlasakis is actually away from this home. He's at, he's at the nearby drive-in. When he returns uh, Bunting informs him about the murder of Gavin Porter and Gavin Porter is put into a new barrel which is located in the shed at the back of this property. The third victim murdered here at 3 Burdekin Avenue and the eighth victim overall is 21 year old Troy Ude. Now Troy of course is the son of Elizabeth Harvey and the half-brother of Jamie Blasakis and of course Troy had allegedly sexually abused Jamie Blasakis uh, when they were younger. Now at this point the torture of the victims begins to escalate as Bunting and Wagner spend more time inflicting pain and suffering on their victims. Troy is murdered sometime in late August 1998. Jamie Vlasakis is asleep one night when he is woken by John Bunting, Robert Wagner and Mark Hayden. All are armed with jack handles. They hand Jamie Vlasakis the leg of a lounge chair and a pair of handcuffs. The four then enter Troy's bedroom where Troy is asleep. As they stand there Bunting yells now and they all begin beating on Troy Ude. Troy obviously wakes up, jumps up, backs against the wall in a state of shock, but Troy is handcuffed, where he's then taken to the bath in this house, put into the bathtub, his t-shirt and pants are cut off, and then he is extensively beaten. As this happens, John Bunting orders Troy Ude to call him Bunting Lord Sir, and he orders Troy to be to call Robert Wagner God. He then orders for Troy Yu to come up with a name for Mark Hayden. Troy Yu then comes up with the name Chief Inspector. He's also ordered to choose a name for Jamie Blasakis. But when Troy chooses the name Moses, Bunting reacts angrily at this because it's a Jewish name. So Troy settles for calling Jamie Master. The torture increases, Troy's toes are crushed with a pair of pliers and he's also forced to speak phrases into a tape recorder so Bunting can later piece it together uh, to make it appear as if Troy has simply vanished or, or left home. Uh, 
He also manages to extract through torture Troy Ude's PIN number. Uh, Troy is also forced to apologise to Jamie Vlasakis for the previous sexual abuse of him. Uh, Robert Wagner begins strangling uh, Troy as John Bunting then recites his previous murder victims. And eventually, Troy Ude is strangled to death. Now, in the struggle, Robert Wagner's hand is actually broken accidentally when Jamie Vlasakis hits him. After the murder, John Bunting orders Vlasakis and Mark Hayden to drive to a local Woolworths where they buy surgical gloves and garbage bags. When they return, all four, Bunting, Wagner, Hayden and Vlasakis, carry Troy Yude into the shed of the home here at Burdekin Avenue, and where later, Troy Yude's body is dismembered and placed inside of a barrel. Right here at 3 Burdekin Avenue. The fourth victim to be murdered here at 3 Burdekin Avenue and the ninth victim overall is 18 year old Fred Brooks. Now Fred is actually the nephew of Mark Hayden. His mother is Jody Elliott, also known as Gail Sinclair. Again, there's a discrepancy in the names there. Uh, at the time of his murder, Fred is living at four Blackham Crescent in Smithfield Plains, which is of course the home of Mark Hayden. On September 17th, 1998, Bunting and Wagner drive Fred Brooks here to 3 Burdekin Avenue on a ruse. Uh, Bunting and Wagner say they're planning on committing a burglary and if Fred Brooks participates in it, they'll give him a stolen computer. So that's how they lure Fred Brooks to the home. Now, when Fred Brooks is driven to 3 Burdekin Avenue. John Bunting walks the short distance to 23 Burdekin Avenue where Jamie Vlasakis lives. Now, okay, let's see if we can... Now that address 23 Burdekin is within walking distance of... Bear with me as I... Okay, so... So that's 23 Burdekin Avenue, which is literally just down the road from 3 Burdekin Avenue, where the murders happened. So Jamie Vlasakis, in September 1998, had moved by himself into this home here at 23 Burdekin Avenue. So John Bunting walked from number three, collected Jamie Vlasakis, and then the two then walked back to the short distance, oh, that's probably only 100 metres away, back here to 3 Burdekin Avenue, where Fred Brooks is. Now, as I said, the torture of the victims is increasing, and the torture and murder of Fred Brooks is as bad and as brutal as was Troy Hughes, if not even more. I think what distinguishes the, the torture and murder of Fred Brooks is how prolonged it was. So, Jamie Vlaslakis with John Bunting walks back to this home here at, at 3 Burdekin Avenue where Fred Brooks is and Robert Wagner is also. They handcuff Fred Brooks, making him think that it's a game. So he allows them to handcuff him. But once he's handcuffed, you know, there's, the, the game is up. They then drag Bunting and Wagner drag Fred Brooks to the bath put him into the pub, into the tub and once again cut off his clothes and uh, Bunting tape records this entire murder Fred Brooks is beaten they burn him with a, a with a lighter and they administered electric shocks to him including to his testicles even more Bunting takes a lit spark uh, lights a sparkler and inserts it into the tip of Fred Brooks's penis. They also burn him with a cigarette on his nipple. Fred Brooks's toes are crushed with pliers. 
Uh, it's now uh, at some point I, I believe Fred Brooks actually just dies. I, I I think he dies prematurely before Wagner and Bunting can strangle him. I guess his body just gives out from all the horrific abuse that's being inflicted on him. Now after he's he dies, uh, Bunting and Wagner drive the body back all the way back to Adelaide to Fort Blackham Crescent in Smithfield Plains, Mark Aiden's house, where he's eventually put into a barrel. Now, Jamie Vlasakis impersonates the dead Fred Brooks for his welfare payments. And in fact, to increase the welfare payments, uh, Bunting has Vlasakis pose as Fred Brooks, claiming to be schizophrenic, so he could get a higher welfare pension which is exactly and they and they pull it off it's successful they managed to do it after the murder of Fred Brooks this is number 23 Francis Street in Murray Bridge and it is only 160 meters from 3 Burdekin Avenue Bunting's house and the main murder house if we pan here to the left um, so that's Francis Street there now, 3 Burdekin is just at the top of this street here, I believe. I'll make sure I'm going the right way here. We just come forward. So, yep. So, there again, back to 3 Burdekin. So, um, 23 Francis Street. This is Francis Street. Uh, that's Burdekin Avenue. That's Francis Street. So, the home of Gary O'Dwyer, as I said, is only 100 and 60 meters away so we'll just go back to the home of Gary O'Dwyer now 29 year old Gary O'Dwyer becomes victim number 10 for Bunting and Wagner now Gary was a a sickly child who suffered from epilepsy but his situation got even worse when on Christmas Day 1994 Gary is hit by a car in a hit and run whether they actually ever caught the offender, I'm not sure, but after being hit by a car, uh, Gary suffers brain damage. So by 1998, he's living by himself in this home here in Murray Bridge. So Bunting sees Gary in the neighborhood walking along. You can clearly see he's disabled and Bunting decides to move in for the kill. I, I find this murder, the murder of Gary O'Dwyer, particularly cowardly and despicable to zone in on a man who is clearly incapacitated physically and mentally. But that's that's Bunting's game and that's who he preys on. He preys on the weaker and the most vulnerable in, in, in the community and in society. So he has Jamie Vlasakis befriend Gary O'Dwyer and Gary's, you know, happy for the company. Um, as I said, he lived by himself. And through Vlasakis, Bunting learns that Gary is on a pension, on a disability pension, that he lives by himself. There's no immediate family in the vicinity. There's no partner or anything of that nature. So that's perfect for Bunting. So eventually, uh, Jamie Vlasakis informs Gary that he has a couple of mates who want to come over for some drinks and hang out. And as I said, Gary jumps at the idea. He's happy to have some some company and some friendship. So on a, on or about October the twenty eighth, nineteen ninety eight, Vlasakis arrives here at twenty three Francis Street with these two mates in tow. And I guess, of course, guess who his two mates are? John Bunting and Robert Wagner, and they're bearing a carton of beer. So Gary invites them into this home here. I anyway, just zoom in a bit into this home and all four of them Gary O'Dwyer along with his new whom he thinks are his new friends Jamie Blasakis, John Bunting and Robert, Robert Wagner they all sit in the lounge and after about 20 minutes Robert Wagner the henchman gets up and begins choking Gary chokes him to the kitchen floor at this point Vlasakis leaves the house and retrieves the Variac electric machine that John Bunting has now 
uh, perfected and of course Gary is tortured with electric shocks again to the testicles at, at around this point Jamie Blaslakis leaves the house leaving O'Dwyer with Bunting and Wagner Gary is forced to talk into a tape recorder the usual the usual thing at some point Mark Hayden arrives and Gary O'Dwyer is soon murdered uh, Gary's body is eventually put into a barrel not only do they murder Gary O'Dwyer but they steal his furniture too to sell and they access his pension that's the murder of Gary O'Dwyer here on Francis Street 23 Francis Street in Murray Bridge I'm standing in front of number four Blackham Crescent Smithfield Plains the former home of Mark Hayden now after storing the barrels in Murray Bridge John Bunting brought the barrels here to this address it was also here that victim number nine Fred Brooks lived even though Brooks was murdered in Murray Bridge he was staying at this home when Bunting and Wagner drove him to Murray Bridge this was also where victim number 11 37 year old Elizabeth Hayden was murdered on November 21st 1998 of course she being Mark Hayden's wife uh, Bunting and Wagner in this home beat her forced her into the bath make a talk into the recorder tape recorder and strangled her to death right here at Fort Blackham Crescent of course Mark Hayden was aware of this he'd left the home uh, to allow Bunting and Wagner to attack and he was part of the plan to collect his now murdered wife's welfare but a spanner in the works is thrown when on November 24th 1998 Elizabeth's brother Garion reports her missing to police now the police think it's unusual that her husband Mark Hayden hasn't reported it they find this very suspicious so on November 25th 1998 uh, Mark Hayden is interviewed by police he claims that Elizabeth Hayden left home after a fight with two of his mates and he named these two mates John Bunting and Robert Wagner now Robert Wagner's name is already linked to two disappearances that of Clinton Trezise and Barry Lane so the police are right on the ball now and of course John Bunting has to move the barrels with police sniffing around so at midnight, right here, five barrels containing human remains are put into a trailer on a Toyota Land Cruiser and driven to Hoylton and to the home of the Cordwalls. Now in early January 1999, detectives Greg Stone and Steve McCoy searched the shed here at Four Blackham Crescent, which I assume would be in there. The first thing the detectives notice is the terrible smell in the shed, which they think stinks of death, which would be correct. And a neighbour in this area here on Blackham Crescent also says she saw garbage bags being loaded into the Toyota Land Cruiser. Police also search inside this home and discover blood stains on the laundry wall. And it is here on May 21st, 1999, that Mark Hayden is finally arrested. The same day as Wagner and Bunting are arrested. So that happened all here at 4 Blackham Crescent in Smithfield Plains here in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, the former home of Mark Hayden. Welcome to Snowtown, South Australia. Snowtown is a very small town. Uh, the population as of 2016 was only 467. It is 145 kilometers 
north of Adelaide. Uh, the town was first proclaimed on December 19th, 1878, by South Australian Governor William Jervis. Now, the most interesting part of the town, of course, is its name. It certainly wasn't named for the climate. I'm pretty sure there's never been a, a flake of snow in this place, ever. <laughs> but actually it was named Snowtown for uh, Mr. Thomas Snow, who was uh, an assistant of sorts to SA Governor William Jervois. So that's where the name came from. But of course in May 1999, uh, this small little town north of Adelaide was put on the map for the most horrific reasons. And um, even though only one of the murders occurred here, uh, the killings would forever become known as the Snowtown murders. Here in Snowtown. This is number 25 Railway Terrace West, Snowtown. In January 1999, Dennis and Anne Cordwell move into this home. Uh, they moved from Hoylton, which is 48 kilometers away, and they brought with them a Toyota Land Cruiser which had five barrels in it. Now the story with that was, of course, is that those barrels originally came from Smithfield Plains and Mark Hayden's property. But with the police investigating uh, Elizabeth Hayden's disappearance, Bunting had to move the barrels. So he put them in the back of a Toyota Land Cruiser, put that on a trailer and towed it to Hoylton and stored it at the property of the Cordwalls. Now he told them that there were kangaroo carcasses inside the barrels and that he had shot them with an illegal rifle which is why he had to store them like that. That was his story I believe and um, Anne Cordwell repeatedly complained about the smell but that was the, they weren't there too long at Hoylton. Uh, as I said the Cordwalls then moved to Snowtown here at this address in January 1999 and when they moved here from Hoylton the Toyota Land Cruiser with the barrels came with them and I guess it was here when he was inspecting the barrels and making sure everything's okay that John Bunting becomes aware of the old bank building in Snowtown available for rent and that's where of course leads him to the bank <clears throat> and of course the police are investigating Elizabeth Hayden's disappearance and they become aware of the Toyota Land Cruiser which is now missing from Smithfield Plains. I think the police in this town, Snowtown, become aware of Bunting's presence in early 1999 and uh, certainly by May 1999 the police have Bunting and Wagner under surveillance and it leads them to this town. On May the 16th 1999 a detective Craig Patterson and detective Brian Swan actually spot the land cruiser on this property here at 25 Railway Terrace but they wait four days before they act then on Thursday May the 20th 1999 detective Stephen McCoy and detective Greg Stone along with a physical evidence section officer Bronwyn Marsh arrive in Snowtown and they come here to 25 Railway Terrace West. Detective McCoy knocks on the door. Dennis Cordwell answers. Detective McCoy says they want to speak to him about the Land Cruiser that they believe was involved in Elizabeth Hayden's disappearance. So Detective McCoy and Dennis Cordwell come out of the home here and they sit in the detective's car so Cordwell can make his state statement which I would have been right here on the, on the street here. Uh, Cordwell explains to the police that the Toyota Land Cruiser was brought to his property by John Bunting and Robert Wagner with the barrels inside and that when he moved to Snowtown from Hoylton the barrels and the car came with him and then he says that the barrels have been moved. Dennis Cordwell then hands Detective McCoy the key and he says the barrels are in there in the vault he then points across the road to 30 Railway Terrace East 
so if we just pan this camera around the barrels had been moved literally across the road now at the moment you can't see with the trees but over the across that railway track is the old bank building where the bodies and the barrels are eventually found detective McCoy after speaking to Dennis Cordwell goes back to his fellow officers and he says I think we found the bodies and he certainly had just across those railway tracks lay the old bank building where the bodies were found this is 30 railway terrace east snowtown and it is one of the most infamous uh, crime scenes in Australian criminal history this up until 1995 was the uh, branch of the South Australian State Bank I believe it opened in 1958 and it closed in 1995 this humble little building would become part of Australian well criminal history now let's get some background information about how uh, eight bodies were found in barrels in this building in January 1999 John Bunting along with Mark Hayden appears here in Snowtown and rents the old bank building which has a vault in it of course from Rosemary Michael um, Bunting says he wants to use it to store car parts as well as drums of acid I think that was excuses but of course what he really wanted to do was store bodies um, he paid everything everything was all cool he was fine and so in January 1999 Bunting began renting the former bank here in Snowtown now of course even though the majority of victims were found here at Snowtown only one victim was murdered here in Snowtown and that was 24 year old David Johnson he was murdered on Sunday night May the 9th 1999 now he was lured here on the promise of a cheap computer uh, Jamie Vlasakis picked him up well in fact I think Johnson drove and he drove with Vlasakis here to Snowtown on that Sunday afternoon which I believe was Mother's Day uh, David Johnson was uh, Jamie Vlasakis' stepbrother of course they arrive here at night now they actually walk through this side gate should we just pan over there we'll get a bit of a closer look of it we'll get a bit closer look later but that side gate there is where Jamie Vlasakis led uh, David Johnson that fateful night now as Vlasakis walked into that side gate he accidentally kicked it which um, he was not happy with because he thought Bunting might get mad at him and also because in the property next door to it if we pan around here whoops sorry about that um, can't see with the fence but there's actually a manager's office in a separate property where uh, an, an old lady lived at the time and she heard the gate kicking and she looked out her window and the like the like has just waved and you know and went on his way but he kicked that side gate as he walked in now inside the bank waiting is John Bunting and Robert Wagner uh, David Johnson goes to look at the computer and when he's doing that they grab him from behind and he's handcuffed and then Bunting demands his wallet and pin number and also to speak uh, certain phrases into a tape recorder so Bunting can lay the stitch together to make it appear that David Johnson's still alive they sit David Johnson onto a plastic sheet where he's beaten he's then stripped to his underwear a sock is stuffed into his mouth he uh, gives up his pin number then Bunting orders the Slarkus and Wagner to drive to the ATM at Port Wakefield now Port Wakefield's about 50 kilometers from here so it's a fair drive there and back uh, Vaslakis and Wagner arrive at the Port Wakefield ATM at around 10.40 at night Vaslakis calls Bunting and says there's no money in the account I'm not sure it was a wrong pin number or he just didn't have money in the account they drive back here uh, Wagner and Vaslakis when they return David Johnson's dead Bunting has strangled him while they were away with, with, the, with David Johnson's own belt 
uh, Robert Wagner is actually angry that he missed out on the murder. Um, they move David Johnson's body into the vault and where they dismember him and put him into, to, into the barrel. He becomes the last victim in the barrel. And uh, Robert Wagner actually keeps a piece of David Johnson's flesh to eat. And while they're in there finishing up, Dennis Cordwell shows up. Um, he lived just across the road here on the opposite side of Railway Terrace. When he got home that night, there was a note on his door asking him to call Robert Wagner. So he comes over and he had his own key apparently. Um, so Cordwell enters the bank and there's Wagner and Jamie Vosakis on in overalls and gloves and but you know he says there was a bit of a strange atmosphere but he didn't see anything um, and geez that guy's incredibly lucky but if uh, just to just to reinforce that Dennis Cordwell literally lived across the railway tracks this is railway terrace let's wait for this car to pass <laughs> This is Railway Terrace East and Dennis Cordwell lived across the railway tracks at Railway Terrace West. Thursday, May the 20th, 1999. After police leave the Cordwell's property on the opposite side of the railway tracks, they enter the former bank building here with the key that Dennis Cordwell gave them. As soon as they enter the bank, there's a strong stench in the air. And there's a six barrels in the vault. They also see knives, gloves, handcuffs. So police quickly realize they put two and two together and they retreat and they call, of course, headquarters in Adelaide. And police from Adelaide converge on this building from Adelaide. At 9, 9 p.m. that night, May the 20th, 1999, a police team have assembled and are ready to go. They of course enter the bank again. Now initially the barrels were to be opened in the city at the Adelaide in, in the police headquarters but for whatever reason they change their mind and decide they will open the barrels and see what's in them right here in the bank. So that's what they do. Uh, when they lift the, the lid off the barrels apparently the smell was just uh, unbearable. I can only imagine what it smelt and looked like. Um, you know, it just would have been like a vision of Dante's Inferno. There are body parts floating in the fluid inside the barrels, um, body parts here, there, everywhere. And they, so they spent most of the night searching in this bank. Um, and they also found items that belonged both to the killers as well as the victims, such as wallets and what have you. Finally, at 2 a.m., the barrels are loaded onto a trailer and taken to Adelaide. There are six barrels with eight bodies inside. The six bodies are Michael, sorry, the eight victims inside the barrels are Michael Gardner, Barry Lane, Gavin Porter, Troy Ude, Fred Brooks, Gary O'Dwyer, Elizabeth Hayden and David Johnson, who was murdered here at the bank. Just here in this humble little bank, or former bank anyway, the site of, well, one of Australia's most, in fact, one of the world's most infamous crimes, the Snowtown Murders. On Sunday, May the 9th, 1999, after Bunting, Wagner and Voslakis had carried out the David Johnson murder, they actually came back to this house at 25 Railway Terrace West to the Cordwell's house and it was here they used the shower and it was here that Robert Wagner cooked some of David Johnson's flesh and apparently he and Bunting ate some of the flesh. That happened here, 25 Railway Terrace West. Okay, so we've gotten the history of the Snowtown murders at this location. Let's go on over and have a closer look at the actual building itself so across Railway Terrace. This is where it all happened. Right here. Now this is sort of this is the front entrance of the, the old building, the State Bank building. Um, 
Yeah, these, these are like security doors, I think, and because there's currently a bric-a-brac shop open here. Excellent place. Um, people are very kind and understanding here. Um, so if you're ever in Snowtown, pay to visit. But yeah, that's the main entrance of the building. Now to access the back of the building, Bunting and Co. If you enter this side gate here, as I said, this is the side gate, if you re recollect where Jamie Losakis accidentally kicked it when he entered on the night of May 9th, 1999 with David Johnson. Um, see this little funny, this this thing up here, it's, it's classic. Uh, someone, looks like someone looking over the fence. I guess that's for all the, the lookers that come around to check things out but yeah there, there's a building a home just behind that fence there it was part of the manager's office building I guess the manager obviously lived there and uh, it's a separate residence now from the old bank building but yes on the night when the Snowtown Bank was being used for the murders there was a, a woman living there amazingly um, obviously she didn't see or hear anything but yeah so that's where they entered but this is the actual spot here of the bank. There's the pub on the corner. Let's go have a bit of a wander down here to the side of the old bank building. Yeah, there appears to be some sort of house attached to the back as well. Yes, but the residents of Snowtown would have had no idea that their this uh, humble little building was being used for the most nefarious of deeds. Truly amazing, isn't it? What goes on right under your noses that eight murdered victims would be found here. Um, you just can't really see much from here, but that's the that's the back of the building. So let's walk back onto Railway Terrace. So the building itself is still pretty much the same as it was in 1999, even though that's 24 years ago. Um, amazingly it still stands, a lot of uh, murder spots, you know, they're obviously they, they are demolished. And I'm sure there would have been a lot of debate about whether to demolish this building. But it still stands. Um, just zoom over the road, you can see a nice little welcome to Snowtown. It's a nice little, it's, it's a very nice town, Snowtown. It's a, uh, it has the unenviable. forever linked with Bunting and Wagner and Co but it is a very beautiful little town so this is where it happened here at the Snowtown former bank building Snowtown South Australia this is number 49 Bandara Court in Craigmore in the northern suburbs of Adelaide this is the former home of John Bunting. Now Bunting moved into this home from Murray Bridge sometime at the beginning of 1999. And it was here also where Bunting was arrested for murder. That occurred on May the 21st, 1999. Police arrived here early in the morning at 6.47 a.m. in fact. Detectives knock on the door and Jamie Vlasakis answers. Bunting is awoken by the uh, noise and emerges. And Bunting is arrested for the murder of an unidentified person who was found in a barrel at Snowtown the day before, May 20th, 1999. John Bunting is hauled away from this home 
That'd be Bunting's last day of freedom. Jamie Vlasakis continued living here until he too was arrested on June the 2nd, 1999, a couple of weeks later, and he was charged with the David Johnson murder. So all that happened here at 49 Bandara Court, Craigmore. Nothing else much happened here. No murders were committed. Uh, but this was John Bunting's final home here in Craigmore. I'm standing out front of number 36 Mofflin Road, Elizabeth Grove, the former home of Robert Wagner. Just to confirm that we are in number 36. Now, no victims were murdered in this home, but um, there were several connections to the murder. Obviously, after the murders, evidence of the victims were found in, in Wagner's home. Uh, but victim number six, Thomas Trevelyan, lived here for six weeks in October and November 1997. He moved in with Wagner and his partner and her children. And of course, Thomas was victim number six. He was murdered on November 4th, 1997. And after living here for a brief period. And, and murder victim number seven, Gavin Porter, who was murdered in Murray Bridge in April 1998. Um, after his murder, Jamie Vlasakis and Robert Wagner drove his car right here to Mofflin Road, and Robert Wagner actually kept uh, Gavin Porter's car. And this, of course, was the end for Robert Wagner. He was arrested at this home in the early morning of May the 21st, 1999, at the same time as John Bunting in Craigmore and Mark Hayden in Smithfield Plains and that was the day after the bodies had been found in the barrels in Snowtown. Uh, when Robert Wagner was arrested here he, he went quietly and meekly. So that's where he lived. Um, now this is Mofflin Road Elizabeth Grove and I live, I was born and raised in Elizabeth Vale which is the next suburb over which is to the north so this is, this is very close to me <laughs> um, you just you never know who you're living near do you it's just amazing how close some of these people were to where I was living but yeah so 36 Mofflin Road Elizabeth Grove the last home of Robert Wagner John Bunting and Robert Wagner were tried together and their trial began at the Adelaide Supreme Court on October the 16th 2002. On September the 8th 2003 John Bunting was convicted of 11 murders uh, minus the murder of Suzanne Allen and he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Robert Wagner was convicted of 10 murders which excluded the murders of Suzanne Allen and Clinton Trezise. Uh, Wagner had actually pled guilty to three murders and been convicted of the seven others. Like Bunting, he was also sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. And as of the time of this recording, which is in April 2024, both Bunting and Wagner remain in prison in Adelaide's Yatla Jail. For Jamie Blasakis, on June the 21st, 2001, he pleaded guilty to four murders, that of Troy Ude, David Johnson, Gary O'Dwyer and Fred Brooks. And on July the 10th, 2002, Blasakis was sentenced to life imprisonment with a 26-year non-parole period. Now that non-parole period ends next year, which is 2025. But whether Blasakis will be released or not, is yet to be seen. As for Mark Hayden, he was tried separately from Bunting and Wagner. His trial opened in Adelaide on August the 2nd, 2004. Now originally he was charged with 10 murders, which was then reduced to three murders. But on December the 19th, 2004, 
Hayden was convicted of five counts of assisting offenders. So he was never convicted of any murder, just of assisting the offenders in the murders. And he was then sentenced to 25 years imprisonment with an 18-year non-parole period. Now, as of this recording, reiterating, it is April 2024, Mark Hayden's sentence is up and he is about to be released from prison. So he should be released back into the community um, next month, which will be May 2024. So that was the fate of John Bunting, Robert Wagner, Jamie Blasakis and Mark Hayden, the Snowtown Killers.